we are very happy to have you here with us today because uh, during this session we will have the pleasure to um, listen to PhD researcher Vera Flores Fernandez, Professor Constanza Parra and Professor Elke Hermans who will share their experience and expertise on sustainable rural development through socially innovative and community-based conservation in Peru. Um, can I uh, make one practical announcement? We would uh, kindly request everyone in the audience to mute yourself during the presentation, uh, but we invite you uh, to raise your questions in the chat. And then after the presentation, we will come back to the questions during the Q&A. Um, and you will also have the opportunity to ask your questions uh, directly to the researchers. Um, so uh, for not stealing too much time, I would, um, I want to wish everyone a really nice community talk, and I gladly give the floor to Professor um, Constanza Parra. Uh, good afternoon to, to everybody. Um, I am very glad to be here. Uh, welcome to, to all of you. Uh, it's always very nice to, to share and to socialize and to take the time to socialize uh, uh, the research we do, and especially with, yeah, with an audience that might not be specialized on on this subject. So thank you very much to to the Vlir for allowing us uh, this presentation. So this community talk is titled "Todos por Chaparri," that means everybody for uh, Chaparri, everybody supporting Chaparri. Uh, the story that we will tell today is a story of a community in the north of Peru that migrated from the Andes to, um, to another area in, in Peru between the coast and the Andes, uh, let's say uh, to the Sierra. They settled there in the comuna de Chongoyape um, in the, by the end of the 70s, and they built a community from rural peasants. So this is not a native community, but it is a, a, a group that migrated there. Uh, at the beginning, they settled uh, in a territory that was um, poor in terms of water resources. There was no water, and this is why they were allowed to settle there. But with modernity, some important irrigation developments happened. So the territory started slowly and steadily to host important agro-industrial agro um, developments. Um, in the 90s, this community, we will talk further about this, it's just for you to have a, an idea, a flavor of what it what is this. In the 90s, this community decided to transform part of their communal territory into a conservation area. They have territory in the flat area, but also in the mountains, and they decided to protect their mountains, which is covered with a dry forest. Uh, and, transforming it, and transforming it into uh, the first private conservation area in Peru. They pushed uh, the Peruvian government for uh, developing this uh, a special a new legislation for creating conservation areas in the hands of someone who is not the state. As we will see, the story of this community, the story of this reserve is a complex one. Uh, uh, Peru is subject to, to uh, political and socioeconomic corruption. Uh, Peru is organized uh, in a, an economic under an economic development model that it is very extractivist, agro industry, mining, etc. So conservation is not very easy in a context where there is a lot of uh, competition for land and resource grabbing. So Chaparri is a territory that it is a victim of violent extractive processes. And within this context, our project Todos por Chaparri is situated also as a project, as, a, as an effort to, to support uh, this community. Uh, so we have built a partnership together with the community of Chaparri, um, 
uh, our universities in Flanders and our local partner university, which is the Universidad Nacional de Trujillo. So these are the main, let's say, the central actors of the constellation of actors involved, but uh, we have tried to reach out and we've been uh, trying to expand this. So let me uh, introduce first the, um, the project as such for you to have an idea of the goals that we have in mind. This is a Blir UOS team project. The goal was or is to trigger the sustainable development potential of Chaparri and its local community, Muchik Santa Catalina de Chungoyape. The idea was and is to trigger and to co-create a collective research process, a collective action research process that it is participatory uh, to support the community in the co-creation of a rural development observatory that could also give them uh, visibility, um, gather information, etc. Uh, another goal was to trigger and support five bottom-up development projects, as we will show to you, and also to work together with colleagues from Peru in the reinforcement of uh, research capacities that are there in Peru and also from us as a co-learning um, experience. So this is a transdisciplinary research project, participatory, where participatory action research takes place. Uh, the local community is a, a, a co-actor, a co-researcher together with us. Um, so there is a lot of attention to locally sensitive practices to try to think on how, for example, local universities and also communities can be empowered through this uh, collaboration. So we try to advance and to put forward local knowledge uh, to local expertise to try to learn in a step by step um, rhythm, let's say. And we, have, as researchers, become uh, activists. So here, there are a few pictures for you to have an idea of how does Chaparri look like, how our uh, transdisciplinary and participatory action research process looks like. So workshops, qualitative um, in-depth interviews, discussions, field observations, participation of local students, um, master thesis students that have joined from there, from, from Belgium, etc. So here you can have an appreciation of the different pictures. Better? So let me explain to you a little bit further what, what is our research project about and how this participatory action research evolved and what is for us uh, the, the main goal and, and the process. So we start from research question. So one of our main research questions and concerns is what is socially sustainable and fair when it comes to nature conservation? How can we better accommodate conservation goals with those of sustainable socioecological development? And how can we better support communities, local communities, as the one of Chaparri, striving for this uh, balance in an unfavorable sociopolitical context? So in the left, we can see a little bit the research uh, process based on um, a, a research problematic that it is grounded on a local reality on a Peru and Latin American con continent that it is extractivist, that there is violence, that there is land grabbing. So there is a very particular sociological history of this community, of the country, but also of the entire Latin American uh, continent. We work together also with the support of theories, uh, with uh, sociological uh, development questions, political ecology questions, environmental justice, but also social innovation uh, questions. And from a methodological perspective, we, we strive for a research process that and, and research methods that are quite diverse and plural, and having a participation and action research as a main a compass. So we start this research uh, with an exploratory phase, let's say a few years ago. Um, um already four four years ago, five years ago, 
um, we try to get to know the territory, the community, the partner universities. Uh, we had our first meetings with the community, the, the first interviews, field visits, conversations, etc. And that led to very interesting participatory workshops in which we were able collectively to identify needs, clarify expectations of the process, trigger ideas, and uh, build trust among us. Um, this led to the organization of a contest that has uh, features of a participatory budgeting um, um, element in which we decided to, to launch a contest in which local inhabitants could participate in, um, in as applicants with, with a particular project that they would like to develop. This was seed funding. We implemented the, this contest because the local community wanted some, time, uh, some, some type of support. The struggle is very strong, so they are trying to find uh, ways to reinforce their uh, resistance. So we agree with the local community, with local activists that, um, the co-design of a participatory process and participatory budgeting in which a few projects could be selected for funding could be a, a good idea. So in 2020, we launched the, con the context in, 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 20, in, in February 2020, we provided also some training to the local community for learn, to learn for them to, to learn and to reflect on potential projects. And then there was an entire plan to implement the context, select participants, etc. And this was uh, very, very harmed by the COVID pandemic. And that what brought, brought us a lot of challenges, but also opportunities in the sense that we had to be to move into a remote mode things were a little bit delayed but at the same time this also allowed to exploit the entire virtual technology that could allow us also to i don't know to offer and to think on other ways to to support uh, the local community especially considering that it was during the pandemic that uh, for example latin american communities uh, and, and and areas suffered most from the land grabbers because they 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 went a little bit under the gra the, the radar so we Let's say that it was very difficult, but at the same time, we discovered that that could also be uh, an opportunity. So after an entire selection process with presentations, with discussions, with a jury, etc., we came to the selection of five projects that would be a benef beneficiary of this uh, seed funding. And uh, yeah, they are uh, portrayed there. Uh, this the idea, our goal that these projects would be collective projects. We always remember say, okay, we want different groups to, to articulate and formulate projects and apply for this. But at the end, what we got more or less were more family projects. So all this process had also allowed us to get to know the community and to do the research as well that, that, we, that we are interested in. So the idea was to, to foster and to, to support projects that will bring sustainability, that will um, support the cause of Chaparri, support their conservation project, support local development, let's say, in a, in a, in a more sustainable manner. So there were, were projects about reforestation, there were projects about exploration of a, of, a, of a tourism route based on petroglyphs, there was another project building and connecting bird watching activities. Chaparri is very, very important for bird watching and environmental education of local kids. Um, there was another project on natural biogas with um, with uh, with uh, guinea pigs, etc. So there we are in the implementation of the different projects. We are going in November to see what are these projects delivering. But we already know, for example, that the bird watching project has been quite quite successful. Uh, they have been portrayed in the media, in the local newspaper, etc. So this has given some air and, and some ideas for the community to, to strive for something uh, different beyond 
just struggling and trying to survive the day by day. We, this also led to a process of upscaling. We are connected to other communities, to other protected areas in the, in the area who are also trying to, um, to think on, on, on ideas to, to, to trigger their community development dynamics, etc. So that's uh, another nice element. And, and, and finally, let's say that our point seven, that it is there, this goal of constructing this, this observatory that we want to do and that we've been doing. Uh, on the one hand, the pandemic opened up a possibility to register things virtually online, YouTube channels, Facebook uh, pages, etc. So at the beginning, we started with an idea of a very physical, uh, let's say, sort of exhibition or center, but now we, we have expanded it. So this observatorio that allows the community to gather knowledge, store knowledge, because there has been a lot of knowledge that has been produced in the process through, through research, through master thesis, etc. Um, this allows them for, let's say, uh, an internal identity um, reflection, let's say, but also vis-a-vis -vis the outside worlds, because yeah, they, they have things to, to show. So this last year, uh, we are busy in trying to shape this, this observatorio that could help in terms of their advocacy and their, uh, their efforts that they do. Um, there will be also a lot of maps that have been produced and these communities need that knowledge as well. Um, so there we are and, and now uh, Vera uh, will present, let's say, the results of, of the research as such. Although uh, that the, the participatory and the action research are, are connected. Ah, here are a few pictures for you to have an idea. Sorry, I have forgotten these pictures. So here there's a picture when we launched the context in the right side up. There is a moment in which where we wrote and designed together with a local activist and with students the entire contest process, the documents that will be delineating the process. Below we have some pictures of the trainings and field explorations. Uh, in the next slide, there we see how the virtual, the remote modality helped everybody at the end. Uh, I mean, we're talking about the rural community and all of the sudden we communicated online. So now we have a new ch a channel to con communicate with them that didn't exist before. Uh, they had to record videos. Uh, we, we really exchanged and we did the best from, from what, what the situation was. And here are some, some platforms that we have built, uh, the website, a, a, a Facebook page with uh, the contest, a YouTube channel, et cetera. And all these will become a repository that would be part of this observatorio that we are creating and we are going to launch in November. Vera, now it's your turn. Um, uh, and yeah, thank you also for the opportunity to present as Constanza mentioned, the action research process has been a, uh, a constant coming back to our assumptions, what are we uh, studying, how to frame it, and how to then try to implement it with the co-researchers, all the actors that we interact with. So there has been a lot of knowledge uh, through these moments, through uh, difficulties as well. So I'm going to present um, First, um, a description, a fair description of the context that we um, the, we could fine tune on the way, as well as some key insights uh, towards the end of this uh, cycle of the project. Uh, so first to talk about the community, I found relevant to understand a bit more of Lambayeque as a region in Peru. So this is a region in northern Peru, which um, generally can be considered as a sort of secondary uh, territory in Peru and in the continent, especially talking about the terms of nature and culture tourism. Uh, basically because Southern regions of, of Peru, where for example, Cusco is located, uh, or the Amazon as well, have received uh, more attention, more recognition uh, in, in terms of tourism for locals, but also uh, international. So, but even if it's less known, Lambayeque uh, has been more continuously getting noticed because of 
being a mosaic of natural, cultural, and historical heritage. So a part of having a unique biodiversity, it also holds archeological treasures left by uh, ancient communities, ancient uh, cultures, sorry, such as uh, the Mochica or the Lambayeque, Sican, uh, which is progressively making this region a destination, a more popular destination for uh, tourists, but also for researchers. So becoming a bit of a center, a research uh, hotspot. But at the same time, this region um, is the main problematic in this region, but also the most important source of economic income is the expansion of the agricultural frontier, which incites uh, land and water appropriation, land trafficking, deforestation, and directly uh, harms and impacts governance and, and well being of, of these uh, local peasant communities. And it also threatens their local cooperatives and, and associations. And also in this, um, in Lambayeque, there are a lot of corruption networks as well. Um, and the local communities have a general feel feeling of abandonment by their authorities. And this can be related to short-term mandates. This is also very common in general in Peru, but also the limited provision of public programs, services, and, and aid in general. So also protected areas in Lambayeque receive less attention, uh, particularly because this is a dry forest ecosystem territory. Uh, which are also less known than, than Amazonian or like highlands uh, landscapes. And due to that, they're less attractive uh, sometimes for tourism or, or the potential is still not completely appreciated. Uh, but as we can see in this territory, there are, there are safeguarding some of their um, eco like, uh, ecological and cultural heritage in eight protected areas in between government-led and private, which Chaparri in 2001 becoming um, the, the first community-based private conservation that is directed yeah, by a peasant community uh, is, is the largest. And it was strategically located next to two national uh, protected areas. And the idea of its location was also with the objective of, of establishing a link between these areas and eventually conform a biological corridor. And there now, like the community of Chaparri, as we could see, uh, covers an area of 34,000 hectares uh, and is composed of arid lands and mountains composed of tropical dive forests. It, this area holds a very rich biodiversity and particularly significant presence of endemic species, which means that they can only uh, exist in this area, and particularly with birds, which what the, which the reason why is becoming uh, uh, or is already a bird watching hotspot, which is not known even uh, by all the community, but also endangered species uh, that are very, very being very recognized as the spectacle bear and the white winged uh, one swan, and it's also home of a peasant community, as Constanza said, uh, that settled from Cajamarca in the seventies, and as we can see in the map, there are many. These are caserillos or hamlets, but there is also uh, in the in the middle of it a small city of Chongoyape, which is a more urbanized area which have uh, schools, health centers, and basic services of water, sewage, and electricity. But what is the community of Chaparri is actually the rural part of these areas, which are most abandoned by the authorities, and it contains eight thousand commoners spread in these forty hamlets which are uh, very disconnected from each other due to long distances and also due to not having good infrastructure for uh, mobilization, which is also makes them vulnerable to rains and flooding. But despite these challenges in the territory, the, the Muchi community, Santa Catarina Chongoyape, negotiated these uh, environmental objectives to create Chaparri, but also negotiated socioeconomic expectations based on participatory ecotourism with the aim to improve uh, community well-being. So Chaparri became um, a pioneering example for many peasant and indigenous communities that bet on taking advantage of this opportunity to alter nature-society relations uh, that are imposed in their territories. So like the community of Chaparri work in reintroducing endangered species in the area, even species that were thought to be extinct, um, like the white-winged uh, one, um, and this uh, reintroduction has been recognized, recognized worldwide, uh, as well as uh, this example of social innovation and self-determination, 
which means that this community from the decision to create this area, starting conforming associations and organizations around ecotourism, around um, creating artisanry. They also organize their capacity building workshops with different actors, also with NGOs, also with, uh, with universities such as this project. Uh, but also they receive trainings to become forest rangers, uh, even the training as like traditional uh, chefs of like the food there, but also organizing sport events, for example, with the symbols of conservation uh, in the forefront, um, among many other innovations that they implemented through the years. But uh, considering that they are in this, uh, in the Lambayeque region, they have also been known um, in the national international level uh, due to this uh, very prolonged conflict uh, that started in 2015 that has been inciting uh, deforestation, land trafficking and uh, extreme violence against the commoners. And the regional government of Lambayeque and agro-industrial elites, but also organized crime networks uh, have been promoting the construction of a dam and, and a reservoir within the protected area. And there has been very extreme episodes of violence uh, that at the end also revealed underlying mechanisms that of corruption, of, of, of dealing with this uh, um, management of property and resources that the commoners, but also the commoners allies started to understand through the years. Um, and in this sense, the, the project, our project is also being part of these actors that have been collectively working to understand more these underlying mechanisms, which of course are not open, uh, and to strengthen these readings, to make them more uh, precise and to create spaces to, to think how to address them uh, in, a firm, in a firm manner. So the Chaparri has these different aspects uh, developing at the same time. They have eco-territorial resistance, conservation, and social innovations. The term eco-territorial basically uh, means that there is a, um, a turn, a movement, a uh, um, orientation in the level of Latin America that is based on the crossing between the pushing an environmental agenda, but also pushing the recognition of ethnic rights in rural communities, but also the defense, the defense and the resistance as a way to recovering sovereignty. So the cross of these three um, important aspects now in, in the region has, uh, has uh, been crystallized in movements such as the one in Chaparri. So we have uh, in between these resistances, like the organization of a lot of protests that were in the local level, but that also reach uh, the governmental palace in Lima, for example. We also have public interviews with diverse channels and social media and, and a very big and increasing network uh, of allies from from all like scales and, and, and from different types of disciplines or sectors. And as ecoterritorial innovations, we also see the, yeah, the extending of this network, but also the, the archiving of their history, the archiving of, of also the information and the data and the maps and, and everything that they've been uh, collecting through the years. And also creating these ecotourism ventures uh, and also engaging in international research projects such as the one we are presenting now. And through all this experience working with them, there was there are some uh, important findings at the, in, in research that we consider um, like essential to, to understanding to move forward with collaboration with this community. No? So the, the most important findings is the, the, the centrality, uh, the place of identity and culture in these ecoterritorial resistance processes, in which the term muchik and the spectacle bear as a symbol are, are very visible elements of how this or how this important is, is being um, is being perceived or, or taken. And for instance, um, as mentioned, the, the migration of these commoners from Cajamarca, that is the highlands, have decided to declare themselves uh, in this territory of Chaparri, Muchik. And the term Muchik uh, referenced the Mochica culture, which is an ancient culture that existed there. So this community, by declaring themselves Muchik, they declare themselves native and in, in, inheritors of traditional Mochica wisdom, practices, and governance systems 
which were uh, very connected to the ecological cycles uh, of territory. So this is a bit of the, the image and, and the, the heritage they want to recover. And this is part of why the resistance in this territory has been also so strong. And, and also in during this research process, we recognize that this need of recreation uh, was pushed by them along the lines of nature conservation and sustainability and community development. And, but also beyond uh, just resistances and innovations, we also, uh, we also see that uh, there is also innovations in governance, uh, which are fulfilling uh, social political gaps. So these innovations are accompanied by progress, setbacks, contradictions. Uh, it is a trial and error process of, of this transformation in different uh, scales. But at the end, they're materializing alternative ways of having these socio-ecological relations that are challenging uh, institutions, deep root historical institutions that are rooted in extractivism to stimulate development. So this extractive reality, uh, ha it had an impact historically in these communities uh, who are constantly been facing land dispossession, resource over-exploitation, uh, but socioeconomic marginalization too, also acculturation like, um, and, and disempowerment at the same time, uh, disempowerment of their communitarian identity and cultural fabric. And by this new agency that they are exerting by creating Chaparri, they are, uh, like as we are reading it, um, overcoming historically uh, oppressed systems and counteracting with alternative development proposals, um, recreating their identities and, and working in this reconnection, reconnection with nature. Finally, we also found important to look at the role of women and women's empowerment in community uh, affairs, but in conservation nature as well, which is and remains to be an understudied uh, issue in Peru. But we consider that it's important to not follow uh, prescriptive recipes to, to understand women or their empowerment, uh, since they commonly don't reflect local needs. So instead, we want to build on an ecofeminist framework to broaden our understanding of the role of rural women uh, reproductive work, demonstrating that the place of care, for example, the caring of the household of the community also implies the care for nature. So this change of paradigm in Chaparri from extractive practices to protection of nature and caring for nature, we see also on the role and recognition of women. So this is part of uh, um, our same understanding. And finally, uh, in relation to to this knowledge that we've been gathering about the process of the community, we see the role of the project uh, in an important role in collective valorization, production, and dissemination of knowledge, uh, which basically means uh, creating bridges between these ongoing ecoterritorial resistances and innovations with our processes are also how we are learning to do this research and action process, but on issues that they are finding themselves important, such as self-determination, native communities, what it is being native uh, and, and, and identity recovery, but also the right of prior consultation, which is a very vulnerated right in, in Peru. And finally, to, to, to having a very important role in facilitating spaces for collective engagement in the building and sharing of, of this co-produced knowledge. And now gives the floor to Elke to present a bit on uh, international cooperation. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, indeed, as a final part of this presentation, uh, we would like to, to talk a bit about international cooperation, um, like what is the added value and also how can you make it uh, as successful as possible. So first of all, thank you Vera and Constanza for setting the scene. I think it really describes a bit that uh, that also for this uh, US team project, we are dealing with a complex issue and a complex context. Um, so that, that also automatically implies that there are multiple actors involved. Uh, you, you can't do it yourself. So I think that's why this kind of setup where so many different stakeholders with different disciplines, perspectives are put together, is really the most uh, valuable way to deal with this kind of project. And when we look at it from a, from a positive point of view, of course, we can be glad about such a big, a big variety in, in all those different uh, matters. So the first element is that, uh, that we include different disciplines. 
So um, when you have a look at our core team of researchers, we already see that, that we all have a different background. And we have people from the social sciences, we have people doing research on tourism, people from the spatial planning point of view, but also uh, anthropologists and uh, biologists so that an environmental sciences so that really means that we put all our knowledge from a particular discipline together and we can really create like uh, interdisciplinary research in this in this respect it also means that uh, people will have have different worldviews especially when we have a look at the different stakeholders involved so a worldview is actually some perspective that someone has based on uh, values attitudes and norms so bringing all those people with their experience together is really meaningful. Um, like what is what is the value of nature protection? Uh, how important is, um, is authenticity in all these discussions? The third element um, as said is that we have different stakeholders involved. So of course, whenever you start off a project or actually when, you, when the project ID starts off, you need to identify the main stakeholders and next you need to get them involved. Um, luckily, um, through this project and, and with, with a good network, we are able to really include many, many stakeholders, and that's a very valuable thing to do. So we are in it as researchers, uh, but apart from that, of course, uh, there is the community with the community leaders and the different community members. Whenever we go there, um, it's, it's always a very warm welcome, and we have all those different people involved um, in, in our um, research, uh, doing all those workshops, uh, giving their experience and sharing their information. Apart from that, there are also governmental bodies involved, non-governmental organizations, and a last group of stakeholders uh, included in this project are the students. Uh, it's, it's a very nice setting for our Belgian students uh, to go there to do an internship, um, and to really um, yeah, generate uh, some, some value, not only for their own academic research, but also for the community and for the project. So we have had some very interesting uh, internship and thesis work of students. Um, and then finally, well, of course, there are also different cultures involved. Um, I think, uh, yeah, there are, of course, differences uh, between yeah, a, a Belgian uh, culture and a Latin American one, uh, but also that, uh, I think, really adds value to, to the project. So as said, we have like a big variety that we bring together in this project in order to get to look at it from different uh, angles and to, to generate the best possible outcome. Um, and also that complementarity is, is really helpful. So uh, not only from a prof professional point of view, but also from a personal point of view, uh, just meeting all those people, uh, building your network, I think it's really uh, very valuable. Um, then the then, uh, next slide is really on how can you make the international cooperation as successful as possible? Yeah, our first um, advice here is that, of course, you need to build engagement as said. Of course, at the start, you could identify possible interesting stakeholders. Um, but you also need to convince them to become part, uh, to also co-create throughout the project, and also to stay involved and connected throughout the entire project. So whenever we all feel um, part of a bigger group with a bigger aim, I think uh, building stakeholder engagement is really valuable in terms of a good uh, international cooperation. Um, secondly, of course, everyone has own knowledge and insights and experiences, so it is important that, um, that everyone feels comfortable in bringing that kind of experience in. Um, whenever we wanted to set up uh, the contest, for example, we also had a discussion with, uh, with the community to see, okay, what would work, what wouldn't work, um, and I think that insight information is also uh, essential to make it uh, successful. Um, of course, everyone also has uh, a different way of, of working. Uh, it relates a bit to your discipline, to the culture, to your worldview. Um, so whenever you want to make a successful project, it's important that you, uh, well, that you discuss a bit how you see things, how you handle things, and that uh, you also find a suitable approach uh, for all. For example, in this project, um, whenever we organized like, uh, like some events, um, yeah, we had to talk about um, yeah, whether we should in involve formal people or not. That was one example of, of, of some um, element where there were some, some differences in, in view about. Another thing was uh, about time allocation. Um, should we spend a lot of our meeting time 
on financial matters or more on content related matters. So everyone has different questions, different approaches. So whenever we are in, in project meetings, I think it's very important that you are very open to, uh, to that communication, that you also have an evaluation of what works or, or, or what doesn't work. Because of course, this is a multi-year project and um, it has advantages and it also has challenges whenever there is a multi-year project. But um, just keeping that open communication is, is very essential, that you are very transparent in whatever you do and that you also reflect uh, enough throughout the, the project. Whenever you organize something or whenever um, yeah, there is a new phase that, that you always try to learn more because, uh, well, you need to work together for a very long time. So it's important that that communication and that engagement remains um, there throughout uh, until the end of the, of the project and hopefully also after. Uh, and then finally, um, yeah, defined common goals. Of course, um, well, all the all the different stakeholders they are part of this project, and and we know that we have identified the, the different goals. And uh, I'm glad that we will also be successful in obtaining most of those goals. But we could also, um, yeah, set more intermediate goals, um, so that in between, uh, as I said, it's a very long project that you can also, yeah, celebrate successes that you obtained so far. I think we have come up with some great. Uh, results up until now, and we hope to do some more uh, until the end of the project. Um, and it's always good that you also look back throughout the project of, of what you already have been achieved, uh, because that's also um, yeah, interesting for international cooperation. Um, maybe, oh, yeah, <laughs> wanted to say the pictures also showed, of course, um, that we had a lot of, um, of, uh, of visits. Um, and uh, that that's of course uh, apart from the uh, from working on a distance uh, together on on a on a general project aim that it's interesting that that there is also that physical visit because then doing those visits yeah really a lot of uh, next steps uh, can be taken and a lot of work is done. Okay, I think that was it mainly for the. For the presentation so uh, i guess the floor is open for questions uh, thank you uh, the three of you for the really really interesting uh presentation and indeed the the floor is open so if you have a question you can unmute yourself uh, and if you can you can put on your camera and ask the question right away um but maybe let me start with um Two questions that were um, uh, that were raised in the chat. Um, one is specifically addressed uh, to uh, Professor Elke Hermans. Um, the question is: as so you mentioned the different stakeholders, and she's wondering um, under which category the conservation stakeholder. She would like to know under which category the conservation stakeholder of nature is identified or classified. Yeah, I think um, in, in uh, my explanation, I, I just identified some subgroups of, of different stakeholders. But uh, throughout the, the process, um, yeah, we really identified uh, more from a content point of view, what are the main stakeholders um, that should be involved in this, uh, in this process. Um, so um, there are indeed uh, people from nature conservation that, that, has, that have been included throughout the, the project. If that's an answer to your question. <laughs> Um, yes, and I think it's a it's a related question. Um, she she is the same person who is wondering um, if and how you addressed issues and challenges of uh, racism and gender uh, identification. Um, how did you uh, like comply to ensure uh, quality among different uh, people involved to obtain the same goal within the team? I can I can answer probably the the issue of gender. You know, in the in the contest, we were striving for uh, projects that would be led by women and by men. That was our ideal, no? And we had very few applicants that were female applicants, and and our disappointment was very very high. 
Finally, uh, we selected one of um, one of one of the grantees of uh, those that became beneficiary. There was one woman selected who had a very very interesting project, but then she pulled down. She her family didn't support her, so she stepped down and she renounced to the to the to the prize and to lead uh, her project. So for us, it's very challenging. Uh, and and by getting to know how challenging was the gender uh, issue, we we got more and more interesting to see where where are women. So we have a lot of struggle uh, for against land grabbing, extractivism, etc. In Latin America, and what you see is that those that are doing the communications, let's say, and the fights and the and in the episodes of violence, yeah. etc., are, are the most vocal ones are the, the male leaders, whereas the, the, the female leaders are a little bit more under the radar, but having their leaderships at other scales. Huh? And, and, and that's uh, taking care, for example, more of the village level, neighborhood, like the soup community one and that's uh, one of the explorations we are doing also we had a master thesis by one of our students as well on that aspect and and we are further developing on, on that i don't know Vera, if you would like to to further elaborate yeah i wanted to uh, compliment because for example in the topic of racism we haven't addressed it directly uh but for instance through uh, the methodological choices we made, for example, when we selected where to have the workshops, we uh, discussed this with the leaders, uh, also just assuming that we are trying to address inequality and not, less, not specifically maybe just racism and, and gender, but also economic inequality that exists within the different hamlets, because there are ones that are more connected to the entrance path to the reserve area, more uh, closely located to the city. The city of Chomoyape or to the roads and others are very far so through the methodological choice of having these workshops not just in center hamlets but explicitly going to very far away ones we discover these underlying um, even myths mistrust that could be perceived as, as uh, being around race because it's a community of migrants so we, during the workshops, we witness, me and the students and the professors, like um, a bit of conflicts between uh, settlers, like commoners that have been there from different generations or that comes from different parts of the highlands or even ones that come from Lima. And we just see that there is some, um, yeah, there is not stealing all the hamlets, this identity of all belonging to the same place. So you see these uh, impositions or these, a bit of jealousy even uh, that could harm social cohesion. So this is, uh, and but through the project, we we identify in that, we try to create then reactions to, to it, to try to help them strengthen this common identity in the territory, even if it's a community of migrants. So yeah, that's, that's what I would say. We try to address this, yeah, inequality aspects. Thank you uh, for for both your answers. I think answer is a question, and um, maybe related to that, another uh, question was asked in the chat. Um, so you mentioned in the beginning, uh, the region is um, yeah facing political, social, economic um, corruption, competition of land and resources. So in that uh, context, um, did you during your uh, project? face uh, any intimidation or uh, yeah, fall back from influential people or groups that tried to, yeah, um, uh, to challenge your work? I, I am, oh, you go, go, go first, I can compliment later. Go ahead, you, you are the local. <laughs> yeah, I mean, in, in my experience, there was a couple of instances in which we were in the communal center and there would representatives uh, of this, this project that they want to build a dam, they would come normally engineers. 
uh, to try to negotiate with the community. So, but this negotiation is starting as such, but then you can see that there is some uh, intimidation aspect to it, but it's never so explicit because corruption networks are so strong in Peru. Um, this intimidation can be very subtle until it's imminent. Uh, and I would say that they, will not, they are strategic in doing that because there are formal mechanisms for them to do this. So um, the, the violence normally for me is more visible when, when these mechanisms are being questioned, when the community is unified. So it didn't happen uh, necessarily like it didn't, happened when we were there like locally, but I would say that it did create pressure for the leaders and, and for ourselves as well in, in the peak moments in which they have conflict there. Uh, but at the same time, they also felt supported by the project because there were a lot of allies that also stopped having in sometimes uh, collaborations or because of, of violence, uh, same as tourists. But uh, luckily they felt supported by the project and and we, we try to to be there during those times. And... Yeah, let's say that um, we've been warned many times by people that are not from Chaparri saying, oh, you have a project there, don't go, it's dangerous. We've been discouraged, but me personally, I have never heard, felt uh, any type of intimidation. What I have felt is that we are sometimes, uh, but I, I don't think it is bad. I think we can play that role sometimes instrumentalized by the by the community because they use us to make their um, their front stronger, no? Uh, to appear in the newspaper or to help them to write a little uh, note or a, or a little video for a press. Um, so, uh, so could that mean that that we could be in risk? I I don't think so. Uh, but yeah, who, who doesn't? I don't know, Elke. What is your perception about it? But in general, it's a very very welcoming community. Uh, yeah, we feel at home. We are always very happy to go there, and and they are also very thankful because we didn't let them down despite the high violence. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think um, it is a challenging context, but yeah, it's, it's not the only place in the world. Um, but the fact that, um, yeah, that the community is really enthusiastic about the project, we are, and that we see that we can, yeah, step by step make some changes. I think, um, yeah, that, that is the main thing. So that, that's why we do, why we do that. Um, Yes, thank you uh, for the uh, elaborative and clear answer. Um, I, I would like to give the floor. There are other questions coming in the chat, but feel free to ask them directly uh, to, to the three uh, researchers. Um, you can unmute yourself and open your camera. Um, very welcome to do so. I, I see a question about how international cooperation can be built on fighting against environmental conflict and I think uh, knowing the, the the difficult situation of many territories in in Latin America but also elsewhere in Africa and Asia I think what is really good and I find interesting it's the possibility to empower also local universities which many times are used to very uh, traditional ways of research let's say having these territories as, as objects of study and not, not really, really engaging. And, and by experimenting through participatory action research and co-building together with them, uh, yeah, it's also very interesting um, for them to, to also to, to learn through this process that research can also be more active, more engaged. Uh, because it's not usually what, what we call research. And for us from Europe, it's also a learning process in the sense that we can see what is possible, what it is not, and, and what effort that means. I, I see another question by Bart uh, Delvon on the, on the issue of conservation and tourism management. So with the viol so conservation and the protected area was developed, 
there was, a, a, let's say, a, a boom of tourists that came because infrastructure was developed and, and so on and so forth. That we could say a lot about it, uh, but, but then with the episode of violence um, that uh, decreased dramatically, then with the COVID pandemic, okay, put it even worse as everywhere. So uh, tourism has had ups and downs with a trend to go down due to the violence and to the, and to the COVID. So yeah, uh, probably uh, more work uh, in terms of investment and revitalizing that part uh, is important. But for example, what we see is that with the project of, of Antero Carrasco, the bird watching project, we see that, that there is a seed there that it's just waiting for it to, to be triggered. Okay, um, we have two minutes left. So unless there is an, a last question uh, from the audience, um, but I think we addressed all the answers that were raised in the chat. Um, uh, Joanna? Uh, I'm sorry about my computer, but uh, I have a question about if you were able to trust how people uh, value, like, how they deal with the ecosystem services from a cultural perspective. Uh, are they evaluating uh, the, their ecosystem services, uh, like from the cultural background? Uh, are we adapting to better conservation for the community? I don't know if you I'm very sorry. I don't know if Elke, Vera, or yes, I, I am afraid that um, audio was not so good and it was very difficult for us to, to hear the question. Um, but feel free to, to send us an email with your question and we will make sure to forward it. Uh, I apologize for, uh, for not capturing your question. Um, but um, I, I'm afraid we came to the end. It's all, almost uh, three o'clock. Um, so I would like to thank everyone so much for uh, attending this uh, community talk. We appreciate your presence and all the questions uh, raised. And we hope you enjoyed this edition uh, as much as we did. And uh, also special thanks uh, to the speakers, um, PhD researcher uh, Vera Flo Flores Fernandez, and Professor Constance Sapara of the KU Leuven and Professor Elke Hermans of uh, the University of Hasselt. Um, I think your research and approach, especially in terms of stakeholder engagement, is very inspirational for other research projects. So uh, good luck uh, with the uh, future um, uh, continuation of this. And uh, thank you so much for sharing this on this community uh, talk. And for the audience, uh, you can rewatch it. We will post it on our website and you can always uh, go on our YouTube channel to, to rewatch it if you wish. And um, lastly, I would like to take the opportunity to invite you for the next community talk that will take place on the 26th of uh, July. And there uh, the topic will be breaking barriers in the prevention of adolescence pregnancy for uh, in-school students in Rwanda. So hope to see you then again. And uh, thanks again to the speakers. Have a nice afternoon. Bye.